Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Alaikum. Welcome to Newsroom. I'm your host, Rumah Khalid. But today is the end of the week, the last show of this week. We have lots to discuss with you. And without further ado, let's tell you what we are going to talk about. We'll discuss, ladies and gentlemen, beginning with the right to self-determination. Now, the a key committee of the United Nations General Assembly on Thursday has adopted unanimously a resolution that reaffirms the right to self-determination for people who are subjected to colonial foreign an alien occupation. This uh, was co-sponsored by 72 countries and this uh, resolution was submitted by Pakistan, adopted without a vote in the 193 members. Third committee which deals with social humanitarian and cultural issues. This is something that Pakistan has been uh, uh, behind since 1981, also sponsoring since 1981. This is uh, serving uh, to focus the world's attention on what has been happening in different areas across the world, with of course particular reference to Indian illegally occupied Jammu and Kashmir and Palestine. This is going to be our first segment, the importance of uh, 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 this resolution that was sponsored by Pakistan. Uh, our second story, ladies and gentlemen, concerns uh, climate resilience in the wake of floods that have uh, grappled Pakistan and of course climate change that is affecting all the different countries including Pakistan. At COP27 as well, Minister for Planning and Development has urged international community to establish the fund at world level for building of climate resilience infrastructure. He was participating in a dialogue at Sharm sheikh on the sidelines of the COP27 uh, summit. He said that the developed countries will have to discharge their responsibility, otherwise the disaster is also going to hit them. This is something that has been uh, said by our Prime Minister, by our Foreign Minister as well, by Shari Rahman Sahib, our Minister for Climate Change as well in the past. And this is something that the world needs to realize before it's way too late, not only for Pakistan but for other countries in the world, including important developed countries in the West. And finally, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we will be talking about Kazakhstan that is holding a snap presidential elections. On Sunday, we are going to uh, talk to our correspondent who is there uh, to ask him as to what uh, the what is the resolve of the people uh, as far as uh, these uh, snap elections are concerned. Uh, how are they participating? Are they firm in their resolve to uh, vote tomorrow, uh, to vote on first Sunday rather? Uh, but what is the main environment as far as uh, the elections in Kazakhstan is concerned? We'll be asking that to our correspondent who is there in Kazakhstan. And finally, Twitter. Uh, we've talked about it in the past as well. We have uh, talked about how uh, under Elon Ma uh, Musk's uh, new uh, management, he has fired a lot of people uh, and there are a lot of questions as, uh, also as to uh, what is going to be the future of Twitter. Now, uh, uh, in the latest reports, Twitter it is apparently as per a lot of media reports in a disarray and it has closed its offices for the weekend. Uh, there, there has been an ultimatum given by Elon Musk as well and as a result there is an exodus as far as the very important social media organization is concerned. A lot of users have bid farewell to Twitter also in all this mayhem. So uh, will we be continuing uh, to use Twitter or be seeing Twitter in the coming months? There is a whole question mark around that. This is going to be our last story. Let's begin with our first segment and that concerns the right to self-determination and uh, the Pakistan-sponsored resolution that has now been adopted and approved by the United Nations Board in the following report. The Pakistan-sponsored resolution and universal realization of the right of the peoples to self-determination was adopted by consensus by United Nations General Assembly in New York, which was co-sponsored by 72 countries from all regions. The resolution submitted by Pakistan was adopted without a vote in the 193-member Assembly Third Committee which deals with social, humanitarian and cultural issues. The resolution unequivocally supports the right of self-determination for all peoples under subjugation, alien domination and foreign occupation, including the people of Indian illegally occupied Jammu and Kashmir and Palestine. Due to the universal character of the right to self-determination and its continued applicability in situations of foreign occupation and intervention, this resolution secured the support of UN member states. Introducing the draft, Ambassador Munir Akram, Pakistan's permanent representative to the United Nations, said that the General Assembly has not only established the scope of right to self-determination but also further crystallized its status as customary international law. Almost all former colonies and subjugated people who are represented in General Assembly today as sovereign nations secured their independence by exercising their right to self-determination but there are situations where occupied people are being systematically denied this right. Pakistan has been sponsoring this resolution since 1981 to focus the world's attention on plight of people still struggling for their inalienable right to self-determination. 
Former Ambassador and Foreign Affairs Specialist, Dr. Jamil Khan joins us online. Dr. Saab, thank you very much to have joined us. It's always a pleasure to talk to you on international affairs of importance. And now, of course, uh, we would like to have your point of view as far as this Pakistan-sponsored resolution that has been unanimously adopted by the United Nations is concerned. What are uh, the issues as far as, you know, proper adoption and uh, this uh, adoption resulting into some kind of action is concerned? Because we are seeing the oppression across the world, whether in the Indian illegally occupied Jamil in Kashmir region or in Palestine? Uh, well, the adopt, adopt, uh, adoption of the uh, resolution of General Assembly, it, it gives us a very big moral um, uh, gain. Uh, we were the mover of uh, the resolution and we are the mover of this resolution since 1981. And that, uh, that is a demonstration of our very high moral ground. And what are the basis of that? In fact, what we uh, are the other co-sponsors, 72 other countries, what they feel is the international law. And international law, uh, any Security Council resolution passed, it becomes an international law, part of the international law under the UN Charter. Under the UN Charter, um, uh, Chapter 5 six, uh, uh, chapter five and 6 in particular, and if need be, at some stage, I only wish that Chapter 7 is invoked, uh, which means the forceful implementation of the UN Security Council resolutions. Uh, I'm just only hoping that at some stage world conscious would uh, uh, really have that much of um, uh, realization that uh, uh, the implementation is done. Now coming back, yes, this is a very good um, uh, sign that uh, unanimously it has been adopted um, and without even vote um, it has been adopted. This basically is the key committee is the third committee whose responsibility it is to look after the humanitarian, cultural, and the uh, social aspects of the entire world. So this committee had considered, and accordingly, it was processed, and finally, the resolution was passed. And there's right of self-determination, there, there has been a lot of deliberations um, in the international law, the customary law, which our permanent representative Ambassador Mani Akram had also emphasized, uh, and that customary law, um, uh, including the Geneva uh, uh, Convention uh, uh, Article 49, which very clearly, clearly stipulates that uh, uh, the change of democracy means the shifting and transferring population from one part, settled part, to the uh, occupied part, uh, it comes under the ambit of uh, the international law and international customary law. And what is that international customary law? Basically, it's, um, uh, the, 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 there is an international uh, committee for the legal uh, the, uh, aspects, and that international commission uh, uh, it, it, it recognizes any such occupation. And in that occupation, any transfer of um, uh, a population from one part to the um, occupied part, it comes under the ambit of war crime. And that is what very clearly is stipulated in that international uh, law. 1940, 1996, it was uh, uh, formulated and the world had adopted it. And it's Article 20, uh, subclass C. It very clearly it, 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 it dilates upon the fact that it becomes uh, international crime and it uh, is it uh, tantamounts to war crime and uh, that further you know that's here it's a little serious thing with the world at some stage or the other has to realize and there is there is a lot of efforts required at the multilateral level uh, to make the world realize and the that is icc international criminal court article 8 and subclass 2 in that there is a Definitive clause, which our permanent, uh, permanent representative had also indicated that unless uh, the perpetrators are penalized, this would continue. Uh, the atrocities, the human rights violation, the change of demography, all. So that is embedded in the international law. Now, but Dr. Jamil, Dr. 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 That, that's very interesting. You know, the, these, these articles 20, articles 8, the subclasses that you've mentioned and how they impact all those uh, who are, uh, you know, uh, doing uh, acts of uh, 
uh, aggression towards their own people, towards people uh, that are against the norms of humanity, that are against the norms of human rights. We uh, have seen countless resolutions, Dr. Jamil, and we have talked about those countless resolutions in the past as well. Just speaking of any illegally occupied Jammu and Kashmir, since 1948, there have been a number of resolutions as far as the Held Valley is concerned, or Palestine, there have been a number of resolutions. The resolutions are adopted, but you know, the whole uh, point is that there is no action, there is no tangible action. Where is that line? How can we cross the line between uh, adoption of a resolution and translation of that resolution into tangible action? Our permanent representative in the debate of this resolution, which has in the past has mentioned about this, uh, and uh, he has named the countries, it's India, the influence, uh, the implementation of such uh, international law, the Israel. Uh, they also influence uh, the, the uh, implementation of that. And how it is influenced? Basically, um, our viewer probably would uh, you would like to give them this uh, idea that uh, there's only one implementation tool, uh, which is uh, inter under the international law, and that is the UN Charter. And in UN Charter, it's Chapter 5, where um, the, the initial resolution is passed and the countries are asked to abide by that. And if they don't abide by that, the partial sanction is imposed against, the, against those countries. And even after that, in Chapter 6, if they don't abide by Chapter 6, all the articles, and the, then the Chapter 7 is invoked, which is a forceful, uh, which uh, uh, could impose the air and the sea route and sanctions plus the deployment of the UN forces. And it has happened in so many countries uh, at so many occasions. So uh, for that, what is to be done? That's more important. And our permanent representative has also played the countries that they should think about having it enforced and that influence if that is taken out. And not only that, but, but it is further augmented that uh, the Human Rights Commission, uh, two Human Rights Commissions, as a matter of fact, they have um, in past all what we've been discussing on our shows and various channels and all what has been printed in various print media around the world uh, it has been summarized in those two human rights commission which have recently been published and the human rights commissioner had um, uh, had uh, in, in in front of the world press you know with the tears rolling out of the, the out on their cheeks they had dilated upon what all uh, is going on into these expert uh, territory, particularly Kashmir. And still nothing has happened because uh, the United Nations Charter, uh, Chapter 6, Chapter 7 has not been invoked. And how is it invoked? Basically, the permanent members. The permanent members of the United Nations, uh, they are the one they have to invoke that. And it is there that that influence is being uh, imposed that influence is being exercised. And therefore, those resolutions are not even tabled. And once it is tabled, it is, uh, the, the chances are that it would be vetoed. So but this, this is a whole technical mechanism. And we so are that is, that is where the technology. pause happens. That is where the pause happens. Because as you yourself have said, there are articles that completely underline or outline what, uh, what needs to be done once uh, a resolution is adopted. And if a country does not abide by the resolution, these are the articles under which uh, there are uh, different uh, uh, subjugations that are put on those countries through different routes, as you po yourself pointed out. But as you again pointed out, it is the permanent members that ultimately decide whether to go with Article 6 or 7 or not. Wherein lies my next question. Dr. Uh, Dr. Saab, do you feel there could be a time in the United Nations when the permanent members will not be able to yield that much power over uh, such the UN resolutions when uh, once they go through, they will be implemented in letter and spirit and the permanent members will not be able to stop or veto them. Is there a possibility for that? Uh, well, the only way and possibility, there's already already in the process for the last several years, the expansion of the UN Security Council. And for that, there are countries that are competing with each other uh, for becoming a permanent member. Instead of five permanent members, once there are 15 or 16 permanent members, there would be more consensus and there would be more realization about the implementation of the international law. That's one hope. And hopefully, that's there is a group of the countries, and Pakistan is part of it, the United for Consensus. There are countries, like-minded countries, they are propelling that uh, 
what should be the criteria of making additional permanent members of the Security Council. Once that's finalized, um, uh, this very question could be addressed. That's one aspect. The second aspect is that we have been propelling a point in the General Assembly in various General Assembly sessions the last two, three years in particular. And that point was that India and Pakistan, because of the Kashmir, we are a flashpoint of the nuclear uh, um, uh, arson. And now, since we are sitting on the Balkan and we have said it in a General Assembly deliberations uh, uh, through our prime ministers, uh, the world probably is not apprehending that uh, this could happen. The day they realize that there could be a nuclear flashpoint on this very issue, I guess that they would have no option but to intervene and what to implement the international law. Because if that happens in any part of the world, regardless whether it's because of the Kashmir or because of the Palestine or because of some other uh, Ukraine or because of some other conflict around the world, if the nuclear weapon is used once, it would spread within seven days all over the world. The, the pharma, the, the particle of the dust which would fly about 20, 51 to 55 kilometers into the skies and then they start settling down within seven days mm. all over the world. So once they realize this kind of a devastation, foreseeable devastation, perhaps that would be the time they would then in their own interest but, but like, like but the doctor, climate change. Mm. But Dr. Yeah. Sir, won't it be too late if they if they if they take action when already something would have happened in that domain? Shouldn't the action be taken before any such apprehension might come to the forefront? Now, ideally, that's what we are trying for the last so many years. But is it yielding any result? The answer is no. Because the multilateral diplomacy, a country like ours, the standing what we have now, the kind of economic situation what we have now. The strength we have now, all these things combined together, the world is not listing that much. And in mm. fact, um, we, 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 we are partnering, we are trying to have our friends who should also propel you. What could be a bigger forum than the OIC? And mm. OIC 54 countries, 57, uh, 57 countries, if they join their heads and hand together, if nothing else, if they go in a block and general assembly, and there is a mechanism that the General Assembly can push this agenda to the Security Council and Security Council would uh, can return it back without passing it. Then again, Security Council push the, pushes that agenda to the, uh, uh, the General Assembly, pushes that agenda to the Security Council. The second time, they'll have to really debate that. Although, mm. again, there is a veto provision there. But at least that would shake the minds and hearts of the people around. That's one. Second, if nothing else, the forum like OIC, which is again formed under the regional um, uh, entity of the United Nations Charter, the regional organization of United Nations Charter, Chapter uh, 8. So um, that uh, if they boycott even economically, these countries like India and like Israel, they would come to those pressure. They are likely to come to that pressure, but that is not happening. So the answer to your question is that we have to really have that much of collaboration. We have to uh, join our heads and uh, heart together to take out that influence which our permanent representative is mentioning in this debate of the resolution, what we are discussing now. So that is the solution. But All right. um, the, the time lag, yeah. All right, Dr. Saab, yes, uh, uh, of course, the UN committee has now approved it and it is going to go uh, come up for the General Assembly's endorsement next month and most probably it's going to be approved by the United Nations General Assembly as well. Uh, do you feel it, this uh, uh, resolution such as these serve as a beacon of light for the oppressed people of Palestine and Indian illegally occupied Jammu and Kashmir? Do you feel Pakistan no, is doing whatever it can in that aspect? Well, within the given uh, domain, within the given resources, I think they are doing uh, even beyond what they could do. And uh, uh, basically, uh, the resolution which is passed in the General Assembly, it uh, has so much of moral value of it. It has uh, the, the, the human rights value of it. It really augments the Human Rights Council's efforts. It augments the Amnesty International efforts. It augments the countries. Uh, those who are favoring and those who are siding for the human rights violation, both in Palestine, Palestine and the Kashmir. 
So yes, it, it does have its value. And then in the diplomacy, in the international um, the conflict resolutions, uh, things take years and years, decades and decades. That's why right. we cannot, you know, just passing this resolution uh, um, the, would not really mean that tomorrow we are going to have its result, but it's building blocks. And um, uh, subsequently, all these things combined together would yield, uh, is likely to yield its, uh, yield its results. So we could be uh, definitely hopeful and we should continue making our best efforts in these directions. And that is, of course, in the platform of the Human Council. That is so true, and, and I'd really like to commend uh, Pakistan's permanent representative of the United Nations, Munira Karam Saab, who's really working diligently 24 uh, 7 more or less in order to highlight the atrocities uh, uh, that have been that are being committed in the Indian Hill Valley and in Palestine and to move towards resolutions that can uh, help those oppressed people. And of course, uh, Pakistan, as uh, I've said it and you've said it as well, since 1981 has been sponsoring this resolution. Let's hope some uh, there is some light at the end of the tunnel and that light comes sooner than later. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Jamil Khan, Saab, former ambassador and foreign affairs analyst, to have joined us, to have talked to us on this very important issue. And we'll continue to highlight the atrocities of the oppressed people across the world and, of course, Pakistan's ha efforts in this very regard to highlight those through different resolutions. Pakistan has been doing that and will continue, inshallah, to do so. Our second segment, ladies and gentlemen, con uh, concerns climate resilience. We've talked about it on different fora, whether it be at the United Nations, uh, at COP27 as well. Our Prime Minister highlighted it. Our Foreign Minister has been talking to different important leaders uh, to highlight Pakistan's, uh, uh, dis uh, pa Pakistan's damage that has been done because of uh, the climate change and uh, Pakistan has been demanding for climate justice. Now, uh, in a recent event, the Minister for Planning and Development, Hassan Iqbal Saab, has also urged international community to establish a fund at the world level to build climate resilience infrastructure. It's a very important point, and let's hope that the world understands it more in the following report. The vulnerable population of Pakistan is experiencing devastating impacts of climate change on their lives through changing weather patterns, crop losses and water shortages, placing them among the bottom 1% of climate risk pyramid. The representatives of developing countries at COP27 Climate Summit in Egypt have demanded establishment of a fund to help countries recover from the damage caused by climate disasters. Long-term climate financing instruments are needed to plug severe capacity deficits in the developing countries. Minister for Planning and Development, S. Anikbar, has urged international community to establish fund at world level for building of climate resilience infrastructure. Participating in a dialogue at Sharm el Sheikh on the sidelines of COP27 Climate Summit, Hassan Iqbal emphasized that developed countries will have to discharge their responsibility, otherwise this disaster will also hit them. Minister for Climate Change Senator Shari Rahman called for international monetary commitments on loss, damage and adaptation due to climatic changes to move faster than the speed of the glaciers melting in Pakistan. Climate finance is now at the heart of the climate emergency, whether it is achieving the Paris goal of 1.5 degrees centigrade or delivering on adaptation and resilience goals. Anything less than establishing a loss and damage fund at COP27 is a betrayal of people enduring ravages of climate disasters and the people fighting for humanity. Sara Hayat, climate change specialist, joins us online. Sara, thank you very much to have joined us. Sara, when you look at uh, this statement that has been made by Hassan Iqbal Saab, Minister for Development and Planning, uh, where he talks about establishing a fund at the world level for uh, building of climate resilience infrastructure, do you feel this initiative is an important one? Do you feel the world is going to react in a positive vein? Yeah, hi, thanks for having me. Um, so when Hassan Iqbal Saab has spoken about a fund for climate resilience, it's my understanding that he's still talking about a loss and damage fund, really, that will also cater to climate, uh, res uh, to climate resilient infrastructure. And the importance of climate resilient infrastructure really can't be stressed enough, especially in wake of Pakistan's flood this year. Um, we saw in after, to, after the 2010 flood that we needed substantial amounts of money and that at, at, at that time it was about $10 billion. Right now we're expecting about 30 to 40 billion US dollars to uh, rehabilitate and resuscitate the flood affected areas. And we've lost close to 14,000 kilometers of uh, road network, about 3,000 bridges, uh, over 2 million houses. So we definitely need funds for climate rehabilitation at this point. All right, Sarah, you know, this, this said, uh, do you feel that uh, Pakistan's different models that it has been putting forward on uh, in COP27 and otherwise, the different statements that Pakistan has put forward, whether it concerns climate justice, climate resilience, uh, 
can uh, can it have a positive effect and do you feel retrospectively also and as a result of that can pakistan also benefit from this successful model of climate management uh, that has been put forward by the global south right a uh, great question so i think pakistan is really doing its best right now at cop i know the cop is ending uh, right now today or shortly uh, but so the idea was that Pakistan would actually lead the discussion on loss and damage, given the kind of impacts we've experienced with uh, with climate change. And because we're so vulnerable as a country to climate change for a number of factors, which are really not in our control. Um, and um, so, I mean, given that, I think Pakistan, what Pakistan is doing on the diplomatic front and, and, and our voice is loud and clear and the fact that a pavilion there states flat out that what's happening in Pakistan will not stay in Pakistan, uh, I think what Pakistan is doing at COP is, is, is pretty great. Um, but that said, I think coming to the next part of your question, which is whether Pakistan will benefit from it, 100%. The idea of a loss and damage fund is that countries most impacted by climate change, uh, which includes Pakistan, because we're almost always in the top 10 most impacted in the long term by climate change, um, Pakistan should be on the receiving end of such a, of such a fund. But Sara, when, you, uh, when we talk of climate justice or climate financing, what I'd like to understand is under the current geostrategic or geopolitical scenario, there are a lot of countries that are not as, how should I say, maybe a bit uh, uh, forthcoming as far as uh, the result uh, that is expected uh, from COP27 or even from the United Nations as far as helping countries such as Pakistan is concerned. Do you feel that scenario could change after COP27? Do you feel COP27 has been a successful mood for countries such as Pakistan that have been impacted by climate change? Okay, so um, so the first things first, I think a conference like COP is almost always a platform to exchange ideas, to put forward suggestions, to sort of fight your battle, to, ra to sort of raise your plea. And when you think about it like that, I think COP has been a great success because we've actually managed to, post, to put a, lot, a, a loss and damage fund on the agenda, something that wasn't even there. And, and right now, we've got people negotiating on whether it can come through, what will the nuances of such a fund be, and that's a massive step in the right direction. And today, the EU, for example, has agreed to at least sort of um, they've come forward, they've come quite, like they've taken quite a few steps forward in the establishment of, a, of such a fund, of a loss and damage fund, which is successful, which is Pakistan's success. It is the success of most countries in the global south. Um, but I think what really needs to be understood is why uh, such, a fl such a fund is being vehemently opposed by the developed world. Um, and, and, and if that's something you'd like me to stress on and so to clarify. Please, please, I'd like your point of view on that. All right. So the idea behind the loss and damage fund uh, is basically, and I'm, and I'm sure uh, most of the audience already knows, it's the, it, the idea is to look at, um, to cater to impacts of climate change on the social, on the infrastructure front that are not sort of immediate. So it can cover... Um, it can cover extreme disasters like or natural disasters like floods. It can also cover something like sea level rise or the social impacts that are going to linger on for decades from climate change or even from a flood. Um, but with the, with the developed world, their uh, opposition to such a to such a uh, to such a fund are, I mean, on the tactical front, there are a number of reasons. They've put forward some very straightforward arguments against it, basically saying that um, why create such a fund when you already have existing financial mechanisms that can come into play to cater to climate impacts. Then they say, who will be responsible for filling up such a fund? Who will be the financial donors for such a fund? And then will um, and what will be the mechanics of such a fund? Uh, mechanics meaning like what will be um, sort of what will be the terms of such a fund? Who, which countries will benefit from it? Which countries will be on the donor side? On the donating side, will um, multilateral banks be included in this? Uh, will the fund be isolated from existing financial instruments? So there are a number of reasons that the number of tactical reasons that are being put forward against it, including a very loud cry that it's going to take very long to to establish such a fund. So the COP was just this COP, COP 27, 27 was just sort of an initial platform from which such a fund was supposed to emanate. But the actual materialization of such a fund could take a number of years, really. 
and i think but, on the but, back but sara sara i'd like to, i'd like to uh, stop you here you know if if it it is going to take a number of years how can countries like pakistan or other countries that could be impacted by climate change in the coming years maybe next year maybe this winter how will they survive in the long run if it's all of this is going to take a, a, a couple of years secondly aren't the countries uh, who are emitting the most of carbon need to be the countries that donate the most isn't that justice well yeah i think that's part of climate justice so our second question first climate justice is really holding those who are responsible accountable but you have to see that the that this is why most of the developed world i think is actually sort of refusing to create such a fund because they can be held li liable if such a fund gets created then the develop then the developing world can ask the can hold the developed world liable and be like you know what you've done this or you contributed to the floods in pakistan so now you pay us you pay us climate reparations and that is something or rather that label is something a country like the us for example wants to avoid and then there is also um the uh, the condition that which country is developing and which is on the developed side for example china is the is one of the highest emitting in fact possibly the highest emitting country in the world but it is still categorized as a developing country in the 199 under the 1992 uh, un framework convention so china won't be giving money but it, will it be receiving money under this fund i mean these are questions that really need to be sorted out um and coming to your first question yes countries like pakistan i mean there is no question that that countries like pakistan or countries in the global south will not uh, um, be impacted by climate change we will be imp getting impacted by climate change it's possible we'll have floods again next year it's possible monsoons will be very erratic next year so um and in order to cater to that we definitely need climate finance the real question right now that the developed world is insisting on us addressing is is a loss and damage fund the best solution or or should we be getting climate finance through other existing uh, financial instruments but you know this said and uh, this said you know climate financing needs to be given one way or the other whether it be through existing mechanisms or newly formed mechanisms but the fact remains that countries like pakistan other countries as well need the money need the money to sustain uh, those who have been impacted by the floods need the money to rebuild the infrastructure that has been damaged due to the floods and uh, the world needs to realize that uh, what if tomorrow it's one of the developed countries that are impacted by it what then you know those uh, the, will they be pointing figures at somebody else uh, or, uh, when that happens to them as well and also don't you feel as a uh, as a globe as a, how should i say as, as as a world that is developing together whether they it's a developed uh, part of the world or the developing part of the world shouldn't they be working in unison when it comes to important issues such as climate change absolutely i mean climate change is not an issue that can be handled in isolation so we definitely need all countries globally to come together and i believe that one of the conditions being attached to considering such a fund is also that uh, even the developing world will control its greenhouse gas emissions by 2025 starting 2025 but without the developed world support um uh, financial and otherwise and which which means them controlling or curbing their greenhouse gas emissions we really don't stand a chance and as far as you saying or asking whether the whether the developed world uh, will they get impacted by climate change they are getting impacted by climate change the united states for example does experience routine flooding or cyclones or hurricanes the only difference is that they have enough money or enough financing to look after themselves but with us we need to cut corners and um so we need fi in financing from those who are actually responsible like you said for for uh, global warming hmm exactly that's so true but you know the whole uh, all of these efforts come to one single one and that is realization once those uh, the countries that are not Uh, donating enough or not, not contributing enough realize the reality of what climate change is it is only then that the real change will happen when it comes also sara to uh, clean and green energy pakistan has been moving towards it there's also uh, uh, talks of working to promote solar power in the country uh, and uh, launching a project of 10000 megawatts solar power do you feel pakistan uh, this is something that pakistan needs to sustain itself uh, in the future and uh, do you feel this is going to be something that uh could be easily adaptable or do you see foresee hurdles ahead 
Right. Um, so Pakistan is definitely uh, planning a 10,000 megawatt solar uh, um, uh, solar generation sort of. Uh, electric generation, but the idea behind it from the government's perspective, at least when these talks were being held, was to decrease the, the electricity bill, because right now about 58% of our electricity in this country is being generated through fossil fuel, and uh, which is imported. And obviously with fuel prices hiking up internationally, electricity is becoming more expensive in Pakistan. And so with the with the creation of a 10,000 megawatt solar power, uh, solar uh, uh, sort of plant, we will be um, decreasing, uh, decreasing the uh, electricity bill for the end consumer, which will help a lot. But on top of that, of course, it's going to have a, a benefit on the environmental and on the climate side, because we're going to be reducing our greenhouse gas emissions and then also helping the environment. And then Pakistan is one of those rare countries blessed with sunshine pretty much throughout the year. And why should we not in cash on that? Mm. Uh, so, so all in all, it's just it's 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 excellent for us if we go through with um, this 10,000 megawatt solar uh, initiative. All right, Sarah. Also, do you feel as an analyst, as somebody who's been overseeing the changes that is, are happening in Pakistan, the transition that is now happening is Pakistan slowly and steadily from fossil fuel to clean and green energy. Do you feel we are uh, at the in the on the right path as far as fostering climate friendly development is concerned? Well, um, climate friendly development is like is a pretty vague and it's a pretty big term. Mm, but it uh, as, far as, it's, as far as awareness in Pakistan is concerned, I'd like to say that the government is aware of what's happening, which is a big deal, really. There are still countries out there that's, that are you know sort of struggling with the idea of incorporating climate change into their agenda. So Pakistan is miles ahead on that front. And if we had any doubts, I think these floods have pretty much dispelled them. Um, so we know climate change has to be a top priority for us. At the end of the day, it's pretty much political will. But um, uh, so like this 10,000 megawatt solar plant, I mean, I, this is this is us working on climate friendly. This is climate friendly development for us. Um, resuscitating and rehabilitating from the from the flood in a climate friendly fashion. So that would mean infrastructure design that's climate resilient that can cope with that can cope with future floods that can cope with future uh, climate impacts would be us developing in the right direction um, our president house went solar last year or 2021 um, that that solar that you know that that's climate development for Pakistan uh, raising awareness uh, projects coming in uh, us trying to champion the loss and damage fund this is all a, a part and parcel of climate development for the country and we've also heard, you know, projects, for example, initiated by the Koreans that talk about solar panels being put on uh, on dams and that is going to increase uh, their energy level and, the, the, of course, the energy that will be made as a consequence could be much more than normal solar panels. Also, uh, you know, uh, we could put solar panels on uh, parking spaces, parking lots. There are so many across Pakistan and that, I think, could, be a, uh, could serve two purposes. One, to sh put a sh proper shade on the cars and the, or the other to uh, garner more uh, uh, electricity and energy. Uh, but uh, for these, do you feel there is a certain determination within the Pakistani community, whether it be the public and the private sector? I mean, I think, um, so we had the nationally determined contributions updated in 2021, which is which is Pakistan's pledges under the Paris Agreement about what we're going to be doing. And under the NDCs or the nationally determined contributions, Pakistan has pledged to, to shift about 60% of its energy to renewable energy by 2030. Mm. Now, that's a massive promise, really, by the government. And um, I think even small steps towards it, setting up solar plants, setting up solar uh, panels, um, allowing domestic use of solar panels, subsidizing solar panels, are all steps really in the right direction. All right, Sara, Bilawal Bhutto Zardari Saab, Shahid Rahman Saiba, Aysan Iqbal Saab, and our Prime Minister Shahbaz Sharif Saab have uh, been highlighting Pakistan's cause and have been talking about climate justice, climate resilience, uh, steps being uh, that need to be taken by the world body in order to help countries such as Pakistan and others, not just Pakistan, but other countries that are impacted by climate change as well. Has is Pakistan's climate diplomacy? reaping uh, benefits for Pakistan and other developing countries. What's your take on that? In the last year, you must have heard all of our leaders talking on different fora, talking to different world leaders. Do you feel we are on the right path? 
I think we're definitely on the right path. And I think this COP27 is uh, us championing the cause for loss and damage is fantastic. Uh, we can't thank the minister enough, uh, Minister Saiba enough for it and the team that's gone with her. Um, of course, you must identify some impediments on the way. For example, um, uh, there is donor fatigue. Countries no longer have that kind of uh, financial assistance to give out that they did, let's say, and, and, uh, after the two, in the aftermath of the 2010 flood. Also, with the pandemic, it's drained resources, it's slowed down economic growth in globally. So countries, again, have a little less money to give out. But um, and then Pakistan has also um, been cornered on a number of other occasions. We need uh, to exhibit more transparency, for example. We need to exhibit uh, more political stability in order to get more finances. But uh, as far as climate diplomacy is concerned, as far as raising our voice is concerned, as far as getting our plight across to the international community is concerned, I think we're pretty loud and clear. And why shouldn't we be? We are actually impacted by climate change. And uh, 33 million people is no joke. And that's the number of flood effectives we've had this year. That is so true, Sara Hayat. Thank you so very much, Sara, to have joined us, to have talked to us uh, in a very candid fashion on the different tangents of uh, climate resilience, climate justice, climate change, Pakistan's effect on it, and how Pakistan is trying to forge unity amongst the world as far as doing the needful uh, for it and for other countries that have been affected by climate change. Thank you so much, Sara Hayat, climate change specialist, to have joined us. Our next segment concerns the elections in Kazakhstan. Uh, they, these snap presidential elections are going to be held on Sunday, the 20th of November. 12 million people are eligible to vote. The polling stations are going to open at 1 uh, 0100 uh, GMT and will close at 1500 Greenwich Mean Time. Elections uh, come months after deadly unrest shook the Central Asian country and left more than 230 people dead. These elections were supposed to be held in December of 2024, but in March, constitutional reforms were introduced to curb the powers of the president and boost the role of the parliament, sparking this early ballot. Our correspondent Fahad Ahmed Misson is in Kazakhstan and we'd like to understand what is uh, the environment there just before the elections. Are people all uh, uh, gunged ho for uh, taking part, for participating in these elections and uh, how is it going to board? What are the different preparations that have been made on different levels? Yes, Fahad, over to you. On November 20, the pres presidential elections are going to take place and there's so much celebration and jubilation about the presidential elections and the atmosphere is thrilled and is full of so much hope and optimism. Why this election is actually important, why it is so crucial and significant, why these elections are getting attention from all around the corners of the world, from all the capitals of the world, that the first time in the history of Kazakhstan since its independence in 1991, it is uh, after 30 years of its existence, first time the President Tokayev has opened up the political system. He has introduced a massive package of constitutional reforms and amendments in all departments of government and all spheres of governance. Now, finally, we are going to talk about Twitter. Now, we all know that Elon Musk has taken over Twitter after a huge bid. But what has happened uh, as a result of it has left many in the world, also the millions of users of Twitter across the world, in disarray. There are a lot of question marks that are being raised. Many of the uh, normal and uh, contributing users on Twitter have left the social media platform, saying they do not know what's going to happen as far as uh, Twitter is concerned. And uh, to top it all, there were talks of uh, uh, how Twitter is going to move forward. Twitter offices have uh, temporarily been closed. Uh, the buildings have been temporarily closed uh, as per a certain order that has been taken out. The announcement has come amid reports that large number of staff are quitting. We know that Elon Musk, when he uh, took over, he also uh, threw off many of uh, the many main employees of uh, Twitter, uh, many uh, important members of Twitter, and following that, there were a lot of other people who also resigned. Uh, now, uh, the shutting down of the offices comes uh, at a very strange time for the social media platform. Elon Musk has called on the staff members to sign up for long hours at high intensity 
or leave. Now, this is a very strong comment that has come from him. He has said, quote, unquote, please continue to comply with company policy by refraining from discussing confidential company information on social media with the press or elsewhere. There are also signs that a number of workers have resigned because they have not accepted the new terms that have been put forward by Mr. Elon Musk. This also raises questions as far as the stability of the platform is concerned. We all remember the blue take and the uh, and how uh, Elon Musk has put forward the eight dollars for the blue tick per month, uh, and that had also uh, resulted in a lot of uh, you know unfounded uh, uh, Twitter accounts that uh, emanated out of nowhere. This said, what is going to be the future of Twitter? This is a huge, huge question mark for a social media platform that has been dictating directly or indirectly uh, uh, social norms and politics across the world. We will be waiting. We will be watching. With that, ladies and gentlemen, we come to an end of today's newsroom. We'll see you, inshallah, on Monday with new story segments that pertain to us, you, you and Pakistan. It's the end of the week. It's the weekend. Have a great weekend, but at the same time, do spare a thought for those who are in need because of the floods and contribute in whichever way, capacity you can, whether it be by 10 rupees, by sending the text to 9999, whether it be by helping all those organizations, our government and non-governmental, and our forces that are trying to help those in need, but to help, you know. This is what we need. This is what Pakistan needs. A collective resolve to help those in need. Allah Hafiz.